continuing a little bit more with uh, this really fascinating uh, essay by Stephen Peck, we'll, I'll, I'll say very briefly that on page 68, he uh, speculates a bit on uh, the Heavenly Father's spirit children, which includes you and me, uh, and wondering about if we take the evolutionary view, whether then those spirit children at some point were linked to biological machines. Uh, Adam and Eve, in this view, would be the first of Heavenly Father's spirit children to be linked to uh, the biological machines, we'll say basically pre-human hominids, with the traditional animating creation taking place as a union between spirit and evolved material. Uh, now, this is a difficult issue. In fact, at the bottom of the page, he says, this approach has troubling aspects. And um, this is where it becomes uh, challenging for more traditional Christianity as well. If we want to hold to some kind of distinct soul, and especially if we think the soul is associated with being created in God's image, then, then often people will try to figure out, well, if you accept evolution, is there at some point when God begins to, like, you know, you know insert a soul? Ooh, I like that, you know, you, ooh, that dramatic foreshortening, insert a soul. Well, and that's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? Um, is, is that how we want to think about the relationship between soul and body? Like at some point, God started putting souls in these bodies. As he says at the bottom of 68, uh, if we remove God's consciousness-inducing spirit children from the biotic world, then logically we have to accept that beings like Neanderthals had no consciousness, which we know isn't true. It's well established that many early homonyms had religious practices, created art, made intricate tools, and so on. Um, and so, uh, as he goes on to say, this idea is also highly dualistic, and it is, that, that is dualistic, dualistic between body and soul, uh, with the idea that at some point God started putting, inserting souls in certain kinds of hominid bodies that we call human now, you know, looking in the right direction here, over there. It depends on which camera I'm using. So, uh, then he says, it's highly dualistic, but in very Mormon rather than Cartesian ways. All he means there is, for René Descartes, where we get the word Cartesian, body and soul are of absolutely, absolutely different qualities. And that's kind of the way typically people think about body and soul. Uh, you know, you have body, material, and then soul is immaterial and spiritual. We might even call it spirit unless we want to distinguish between soul and spirit. And then it's just getting, by the way, it's getting more and more complicated. Um, I, I avoid these sorts of things whenever possible. For Mormons, it's dualism. But remember, since for Mormons, everything is matter of some kind, or to some degree, or of some, you know, some is more fine, some is more coarse. Our bodies are coarse matter. For LDS, the spirit is a finer kind of matter. So it's a dualism, but it's a muted dualism since it's all material. But still, the problem remains that how, how do you talk or think about God beginning to like sort of insert or plant souls and bodies, uh, you know, in an evolutionary scenario? Uh, let's see. I love what he has to say about design in Mormon theology. We'll talk more about this, but, you know, within Christianity and certainly to some extent Judaism and Islam, probably not the same extent as, well, we'll just say Islam, I think, does have a pretty strong argument from design as well as Christianity. And that's simply, we call it the teleological, it's spelled the way it sounds, teleological argument that you can see the evidence for God in the design in the world or the patterns, the harmony, uh, we'll even call them the natural laws, the beauty. I'm looking out my window right now to 
that beautiful, beautiful Pacific Ocean. And the teleological argument would basically be, how did we have how do we have such a beautiful, well ordered world? And uh, the answer in this case is because there's God who is the designer of it. Okay, so Peck asks, will the design argument work for Mormon theology, or is it is it needed? How important to our theology is the idea that God is the designer in creation? A little uh, about ten lines down in that paragraph, page sixty nine, he says, currently. We know that the natural law of evolution through natural selection can fully explain the complexity of life on earth and presumably life elsewhere. I love that little. Therefore, the question logically follows. Are the arguments for God from design necessary or important to a Mormon theology? Christian theologians and apologists have spilled significant quantities of ink over design. But why this question matters deserves some examination. For example, in relation to the embodiment of God, as LDS people believe it, did he design his body? And the right answer would have to be no. Okay? Um, uh, And in fact, this is what Peck says a little bit later, bottom paragraph, eh, about 10, 12 lines from the bottom of 69. If God's embodiment implies some sort of biology, maybe not exactly like human biology, but some sort, then the design comes from elsewhere because God is that body, okay? Uh, LDS thinkers have speculated since the time of Joseph Smith and Orson Pratt that God works within natural law. If this principle includes evolution through natural selection, it's an if, it seems that attempts to distance ourselves theologically from evolution would be a grave error. Thus, if we interpret the theory of evolution in a Mormon framework, it constitutes a potentially helpful and perhaps even necessary explanation for an embodied God rather than merely posing problems for natural theology. Now, he's saying a lot there, but let me um, sum it up. Um, He's saying, if indeed God is, uh, you know, we'll say the product of a developmental process where God was once uh, at least something like we are, uh, maybe even like we, maybe even human like we are. Getting, it's too bright all of a sudden. What's going on? Hey, I don't, ah, I don't want to look like I'm being transfigured before you. Hold on. I feel like it might have been something when I touched the screen, something happened. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I don't know if that's making any difference to you, but it is to me. Maybe it was. To, I don't, who knows? I'll see later. Am I looking in the right direction even? Oh, over there. Sorry about that. All right, where were we? So God and all gods in the LDS cosmology are subject to some kind of set of laws that are eternal and uncreated. There's no assumption that there's some primal originary God, as far as I know, and certainly LDS would say if there is, We know nothing about such a being. Uh, What you have instead is basically an eternal regression of deities and presumably also an eternal progression or future production of deities as they uh, have offspring in other worlds, some of whom will abide by the eternal principles that will make them qualified to do the same thing. So part of the question would be, are the principles like that LDS believe hold for human beings on this world, are they the same principles in other worlds? Or are the principles, let's say like that involve church ritual, uh, temple ritual, I should say, and baptism and so on, are those the same everywhere? Or did Heavenly Father and maybe Mother and maybe uh, 
their first son, Jesus, um, have some role in creating the specific principles for this world? And I don't think LDS people try to answer that question. Those are the kind of questions I like to ask. But even if they were to say Heavenly Father or the gods, uh, whatever number, for this world have created principles of progress, progression for this world, there are still eternal laws, we might call them the laws of physics or, or something, that are at play, or of biological laws, are, that are at play in the reproduction of bodies that are necessary for spirits to become deities. Because without this period, I mean, why LDS people think we're here right now is because some of us spirit children are working hard, we'll say, uh, striving to achieve divine glory. Um, you know, getting married, as I said, getting married in the temple, uh, optimally having children, being a faithful Mormon, following all the temple ordinances. Uh, I don't want to misrepresent, and I don't think I am, that such people would at least have the potential, it probably would then depend on further performances, ritual and otherwise, in future life, but that they do have that possibility. Now, I'll just end real quickly with um, uh, 73, uh, where in the big middle paragraph, Peck writes, a melding of evolution and theology also introduces another area important in Mormon thought. Uh, he talks here about the path that leads to exaltation, the very thing I've just been mentioning, suggests a kind of, at least, Darwinian selection process, it's true, in which elements of trial, testing, and proving are inherent parts of the progression through the first and second estates of premortal and mortal context. Our classically conceived intelligences, remember that's like the way back uh, beings, the sorts of entities also subject to natural selection. The book of Abraham, which is in the Pearl of Great Price, describes intelligences as varying in traits. Remember earlier I said our intelligence is all basically the same. Varying in traits relevant for becoming more and more godlike such as intelligence, righteousness, obedience, and so on. Uh, wow. And I got to stop there. Maybe the last sentence. Not only might evolution be the principle behind the beauty, wonder, and diversity of life in the universe, it may also drive the selection processes that help produce our eternal destiny. This Stephen Peck, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give him credit. He's one dude that is trying to think as coherently and consistently as he can as a biologist and as an LDS uh, believer, which means to me he's a good model. I, I'm not LDS, but he's a good model for somebody really trying to think thoroughly about the implications of both his faith. And maybe you're not fully on board with, uh, and you don't have to be, but you know, for me, um, as I take... Uh, evolution very seriously as an account or description of um, our universe and of life on this planet, uh, the kind of thing that, that Peck is trying to do um, is a model for me as a Christian theologian. Oh, I'm letting this go terribly long. That's all on Stephen Peck and Evolving Faith.